Tin Tin. That's Chinook jargon for bells. You're hearing the fort's bells that rang throughout the day, alerting residents of the fort and village to the time. For the villagers, bells at dawn called them to their jobs. The 8 a.m. bell signaled that it was time for their breakfast. At 1 p.m., the bell announced lunchtime. The 6 p.m. bell sounded the traditional workday's end, at least the part of the day the villagers labored directly for the company. Not surprisingly, many domestic tasks were left to do well beyond 6 p.m., keeping all busy until it was time to sleep before starting the day again. The field you are standing near would have once been a scene of great activity, populated with houses, storage sheds, fences, and fenced corrals. The path next to us was once a bustling transportation corridor, linking the village, the fort, and the waterfront. Villagers here would have been transporting items between sites, trading or bartering for goods, preparing meals, drying seasonal foods, farming nearby company lands, sewing, laundering, and tending to livestock in small corrals or horses at the nearby stable, cleaning recently hunted animals, repairing buildings, raising children, and processing fish at the waterfront salmon store for transport to Hawaii. That's a lot of work. It may be hard to believe now, but Fort Vancouver's commercial influence stretched all the way to London, England. It administered 700,000 square miles of Northwest North America, eventually all the way north to Sitka, Alaska, west to the Hawaiian Islands, and east to the Rockies. To keep the wheels of commerce rolling, male villagers worked as farmers, canoe paddlers and guides, lumbermen, tinsmiths, blacksmiths, coopers, bakers, and other positions. These men were called engagés because they were engaged by the company in contracts lasting one to three years. They also worked year-round, often helping with seasonal duties that mirrored the winter fur trapping expeditions, the arrival and departure of supply ships from England, plus some emergencies such as forest fires and shipwrecks. Their pay came annually and was awarded to them in the form of credit in the company store. Goods needed for their daily lives, a pot for cooking, a cup for tea, a toothbrush, a razor, snuff, rum, and forks were available for purchase from the company or perhaps through the trade and barter network in the village. Female villagers did domestic chores and supplemented their husbands' rations by trading, bartering, or foraging for food. They also worked informally at times for the company, taking in laundry and sewing for the men at the fort. Women also worked in the manufacture of candles and portage straps and as farm laborers and salmon processors. Children too participated in village economy. In the mornings, boys and girls could attend school in the fort. Besides formal studies in reading, writing, and arithmetic, they learned trades work and European morality and were given Christian religious instruction. In the afternoon, boys went off to the fields to work while girls assisted their mothers in the home. Daily life was not all drudgery, though. Excavations have turned up toys, dominoes, whistles, rum bottles, snuff, and pipes. Finery like brooches and rings suggests access to some luxury items. Records of entertainment, books, dances, music, and theatrical performances paint a more complex picture of village life than we in the 21st century can imagine in a time before computers, TVs, cell phones, and tablets. As you walk around the area, take advantage of the maps and photos that flesh out a normal workday of the villagers. If you look toward the highway, you see the land bridge. Walk to the top of this monument and look out over the village.